A business plan is an essential roadmap for companies to succeed. It provides insights into a company's strengths, weaknesses, and opportunities. This business plan is a living document that generally projects three to five years ahead and outlines the route a company intends to take to grow and expand. Likewise, it is just as important to create a business plan or care plan to coordinate the needs of a frail elder. Care planning is the process of creating a roadmap that identifies how the care of a frail elder can be best coordinated to meet their long-term care needs, improve their quality of life, and maintain their independence for as long as possible. In today's Vital Living Forum, we'll explore the different types of elder service professions that exist in Central Florida, how the strengths and needs of an elder can be assessed, and how care services can be coordinated as families work to develop a living, breathing care plan. I'm Katie Dagene, and let's get started. Joining us for today's shows are Patty Antony and Amy O'Rourke. Patty Antony is a physical therapist with 33 years of experience. She is also a board-certified geriatric clinical specialist, certified aging in place specialist, and a care manager. Patty is the founder and president of Elder Advocates, Inc., a care management company. Amy O'Rourke is a licensed nursing home administrator. She has served on the board of directors for both the National Association of Professional Geriatric Care Managers as well as the Florida Geriatric Care Managers Association. Amy is the founder and president of the Cameron Group, a geriatric care management company. Ladies, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. Uh, Amy, let's go ahead and get started. Before we start talking about um, developing a care plan, it's important that we know the different way the elders in the United States are cared for. What are the different ways? There's a variety of ways. There's a, a concept called continuing care retirement communities where you have three or four levels of living on one campus. You have assisted living facilities which have uh, care for the physical needs of the elder and then you have skilled nursing facilities otherwise known as nursing homes and that cares for the totally dependent elder. You have the daycare concept where an elder can go somewhere for the day and then come home and then you have home care in which there's four or five different categories of types of caregivers for home care. And is it true that most elders are actually cared for in their home, Patty? That is true. Only about 4% of seniors actually reside in a nursing home. And that number really hasn't changed, despite the number of people living way mm -hmm. beyond 85. Mm -hmm. Of course, as you get over 85, the numbers of people residing in a nursing home do increase somewhat. But um, the majority of seniors, which is considered over 65, mm -hmm. um, live at home. So let's, let's jump right into this. What are some of the different types of services that are available right here in Central Florida? In Central Florida, really in the state of Florida, you can get care from a licensed home care company. And a licensed home care company provides employees who are workers' comp insured and insured as employees that work in the home, the company absorbs all the liability of the care that that person's providing. You get care from a nurse registry. A nurse registry employs what's called 1099s or independent contractors. Okay. So those people go into the home, but they are not insured and they are not employees, so the liability is uh, borne by the family. And then people hire friends, they hire people from websites, uh, privately um, and so those are really the three ways of receiving care in the home and the and the fees associated go up with home caregivers typically paying uh, charging less mm -hmm. and you you pay the most if you get it through a home care agency now there are a lot of options yeah. I imagine that gets confusing especially mm -hmm. as you're looking at liability and different options mm -hmm. and prices mm -hmm. right um, home care can be a companion type of person who is just going to help with errand running and not really physical assistance as much as just um, being there to, to assist. And then you can have home care that is um, more skilled where people have a license or a certification to assist with physical needs in the shower and, and lifting and some of that type of thing. And the prices go up. It can start at maybe 15 or $16 an hour going up to about 20 mm -hmm. bucks an hour, wouldn't you say? Yeah. yeah. And if I could add to this, the kids will come to come to professionals and they'll say, oh, I'm just gonna hire, you know, so-and-so to come into my home. And right. that, you know, barely scratches the surface. And then we, or it gets described to them the ways that they can secure home care. And you can see the complexity overwhelms the mm -hmm. kids. So I, I'm, I'm, I have to attribute Vital Living for even doing this series because I would like for the elder to understand and the families to understand that when you start talking about home care, it's very complicated. Mm -hmm. it um, it's just very complicated. 
so how do you determine what type of professional is needed in terms of what, what, how do you make recommendations? What are some of the things that they need to be considering, that the kids, the family needs to be considering? They, they need to, first of all, be sure that the person is background checked. I mean, you want to make sure that the person that you're bringing into this house that's going to have access to a lot of stuff mm -hmm. um, is, is a trustworthy person. Um, there's a variety of ways that that can be done, but um, I always recommend that people use an agency that has that already in place because it's it's a lot simpler. Um, you want to make sure that the um, the caregiver is a good personality match, and so what people don't understand is that they sometimes think that they have to accept the aid that shows up at the door, mm -hmm. and it may not really be the right person. It might need to be a couple of people that you have to go through before you find that right personality mm -hmm. match. My dad was very had a, had a very significant dementia, and he had a very paranoid thing about people coming into the house. We went through a variety of caregivers, but the way I finally got him to accept a caregiver was I told him that she would be a personal assistant to him, that she would do things that he couldn't do any longer, that she would be his, his arms. I went out to get groceries and came back, and my father had her digging up the sprinkler system. So, <laughs> so he took that a little. So he took that a little far, but you know what? That aid now Whatever works. That aid has been with us for over 16 years. Dad's passed away. She's now taking care of my yeah. mom. She looked at me, winked, and said, "I think I passed the test. And now I know how to right. change sprinkler heads right. too." So. Right. Right. Now, one of the things that I know people, you know, obviously considering is, is what does everything cost? So, how much of a role does finances play in this? Well, it's the guiding force. Mm -hmm. If you can't afford it, it's not an option. So the very first conversation is, what's your long-term budget? And here's what I would say to, to the kids. The elder has saved, and, and then they get to where they need to spend their savings, and they don't want to do it. Right. So that's mm -hmm. like the, the, the landscape that they're working under. Mm -hmm. But if an elder is on a fixed income, it, and it might not be realistic to pay for home care. So if they have a budget of 3000 a month, and it's going to be 5000 a month to get in-home care, then we have to look at a less expensive alternative. So the, the finances is the driving force. And what I recommend people do is try to get help finding money out there that might help pay for the care. Sure. But those things, an elder, it takes some coaxing for them to be comfortable talking about mm -hmm. their money with their children. Right. It's a really intimate mm -hmm. topic and sometimes having um, people there to help get that conversation going, it breaks the tension to say, okay, now you've saved, here you are, and it's, it's okay to spend. Mm -hmm. This is what you've been saving for. Right, right, right. And I find that most kids really don't want their mo parents' money. They yeah. really want their parent to live well and healthy. Mm -hmm. um, there are those who, who may have a different slant on that, yeah. but for the most part, the people that I see are really people who are deeply concerned about their parents getting the best of care, mm -hmm. and they're not as concerned about parents spending money, but mm -hmm. the parents are concerned about it. And they, they're so fearful of spending more than they bring in because yeah. all their life they have lived within their means, most of them, and then mm -hmm. they, the thought of, of dipping into these assets mm -hmm. is, is very fearful. And it, it's funny because there can be patient, uh, some of my clients that have plenty of money probably couldn't spend it if they started today. And, um, and they still have that fear that they're going to out, outlive their money mm -hmm. and that they're not going to have enough. So as we talk about finances and elders who maybe don't want to spend the money, are they also intimidated about what it actually costs? Oh, you should see their faces. When we say, if you want eight hours of care a day for, for the month, it'll be 3000 a month. And they are aghast. They are absolutely. And when I hear myself saying it, oh, the nursing home cost is now 8000 to 9000 a month. I feel like it's a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So for them, it's always shocking. Right. And people, people always think, well, I'm just going to stay home. Mm -hmm. They're not realizing that that can be the most expensive option. Mm -hmm. I mean, staying home is not always cheap. And people get to be prisoners in their own home. So home isn't always the best place. Mm -hmm. you know? So yeah. socially they get isolated and every other thing. Right. And then I'm not going to spend, I'm not going to spend, or I'll get care next month or the next month. And then they have an accident. Mm -hmm. They fall, mm -hmm. break a hip, mm -hmm. or something happens. And then it's a really expensive mm -hmm type of care. So what we say to people is start off with a little bit so that you can prevent a really big expensive health care bill. Right, right, mm -hmm. absolutely. So give me an example of when families typically realize that they need some help caregiving, whether it's in the home or outside of the home. At what mm -hmm. point do they, are they at where you, they come to you for, for more information? 
Usually it's crisis, isn't it? I mean, well, it, it usually it's yeah. crisis, but there's also a stage of compromise, right. which is mom is kind of not wanting to go to the grocery store anymore. It's really weird. So they get uneasy. Right. They come home for Thanksgiving, mm -hmm. and mom hasn't been taking meds, or she's a little confused. She's obviously lost some weight. The yeah. house is a mess. There's some late notices sitting on the mm -hmm. table. Maybe there's a little hoarding behavior uh -huh. beginning. And then um, they bring it up, and the mom or dad says, no, 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 I'm fine. Yeah. Everything's yeah. fine. My doctor says I'm doing great. Mm -hmm. and, the, and, they're, and they're afraid to go home and put their kids back in school because obviously she's mm -hmm. not quite all right. Mm -hmm. right. And now, so, what, now what do we do? And I'd say that's a really typical scenario, yeah. wouldn't yeah. you? And yeah. it's it's um, a realization that, oh boy, we can't really ignore things this anymore. Are, yeah, yeah. Things we, can't, are, we can't just let this go. And, how, how do you convince, um, whether it's kids or, or the elders, that something like this is the right thing to do? It's time. Well, mm, I'm going to say I stage that conversation for later. First, I try to get them to talk about how scary it is mm -hmm. yeah. because everybody doesn't want to talk about it because everybody's scared. The elders mm -hmm. scared they're losing, that they're in the stage of the end of their life. Mm -hmm. The kids are afraid of looking at the decline of their parent. Right. And so everybody's scared. So if you can get all that kind of brought up, right. then talk about, you know, this is a really tough time, but it can be a beautiful time. Mm -hmm. So let's kind of work together to make this time as productive and well as possible once you get that angst up and, and sorted through. Right. And I think a lot of times kids are afraid to say something. It's, there's still that parental role. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they're, they're a little afraid to say something disrespectful yeah. of their parent, yeah. even though mom may be doing some really crazy stuff. They may be afraid to have that conversation in front of her. So oftentimes we'll start, it might be the kids that begin the conversation with me and we bring mom into it a mm -hmm. little bit later in because then I have an idea of what I'm looking for and what I need to really assess without overwhelming the, the parent. It, it's, it, is, it can be a very daunting type of thing. It doesn't have to be, yeah. but a lot of times people are, are really, they are, it's an emotional time. Mm -hmm. It's a very emotional time and, and, um, and sometimes it's under a time crunch because they have to get back to work or they have to get back to, mm -hmm. they're, they're up from out of state mm -hmm. and they're only here for the weekend or whatever right. and so mm -hmm. they, they're under a crunch to get something accomplished quickly. And usually they want it to be a big thing Mm -hmm. And we encourage something yeah. small. Yeah. Okay, baby um, steps. Yeah, baby steps. I'll use my dad as an example. He's 85, mm -hmm. and it's taken us a year to help him understand the value of a cane. And okay. now he's using it. Mm -hmm. And it's taken a year. Right. So I went up to see him. We went to the airport. He sat down. I realized he didn't have his cane. He realized he didn't have his cane. I sat there holding my breath, and he leaned over and he said, I forgot my cane. <laughs> so, you know, and I felt like that was progress. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it's not the big move to assisted living. It's not the big move getting right. a caregiver. It's a little something that says, okay, I'm open to getting help. And, and those baby steps are really important because it's, it's a, um, it can really set a, a senior back making a big move. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because especially right. if they're starting to really rely on routine mm -hmm. to right. function and then suddenly you pull them out of the right. routine, you can really see them go downhill yeah. fast. So we'd really try to work with the situation that they're in mm -hmm. and start to introduce maybe a person that, like with my father, she was not going to do personal care. He wasn't mm -hmm. going to get naked with a lady yeah. that he barely yeah, met, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And so, and so at the at the beginning, we yeah. she actually went fishing with him. She did things mm -hmm. that were fun with him. Yeah. He got to know her. He felt more comfortable. And then as his physical frailty started to become more apparent, mm -hmm. he was more willing to let this woman sure. sort of be more involved in personal care. I've had a couple of seniors where they wouldn't let him in the house. Yeah. I mean, they'd mm -hmm. lock the door and. And, and, and the caregiver was on the other side <laughs> of the door. So we didn't try to bring them in the house. We had them drive them to the grocery store and to the doctor's appointments right. and so forth. They were more of a driver mm -hmm. than they were of a caregiver and, right. and it gradually brought that person in. Then when we had to make a move, that person went with them initially at mm -hmm. least to mm -hmm. help them adjust to the new environment. And it wasn't such a traumatic, you, you know, everybody likes to wrap it up with a bow. Mm -hmm. It comes unwrapped. Yeah. These are people. It's never going to stay tied. Right. You're going to have mm -hmm. to be flexible 
people and kind of work with it. Mm -hmm. So. And I would imagine independence is, is also an issue. I know uh, for our yeah. family with my grandmother, who's in her 90s, when she Aww. had to bring a caregiver in, it was, it was giving up a little bit of that independence and letting yeah. someone into your home when you have your routine and, right. and your set way of how oh, you're living. Oh, it's yes. so true. I can tell when I walk into a home that the elder is thinking this is the beginning of the end. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it, and it really is. And so, it, not the beginning of the end like death, but it's, it, it's a change. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And every change is an ending and it's a beginning. So, um, but that's a really dead on statement mm -hmm. you're making. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How does the care plan help n not just the elder, uh, but the, the caregiver as well? So we go back to the plan here, having this plan in place is beneficial all around. Right. It's all around. What I would say the big benefit of the care plan is for the children to be able to step back mm -hmm. and see that the goals are being met. Mm -hmm. okay. So I'll give you an example. We have had a woman we helped move to an assisted living facility and the son called and he just was upset, upset because she's still wanting to come home and she's, she's every time I see her she wants to come home and he just, he was so frustrated and emotional but she was in the facility eating three meals a day. She mm -hmm. was starting to go to activities, but when he went there, he didn't want to hear anything negative. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the care plan was we're going to get her moved and stabilized, and that had been met. So when I talked to him, he just calmed down because he thought, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So we, it's Not a an process, event. and <laughs> right. I, yeah. we did it. Okay. So that it helps the kids, I think, with their own right. perception and their own expectations to keep them realistic. It's mm -hmm. objective, mm -hmm. and and you're setting you're setting up a, a, a road map, right? And they can see the the steps along the way. Mm -hmm. I think that helps, um, and also sometimes you have to project it out a little bit because maybe they've been newly diagnosed with Alzheimer's and, and we know what it's going to look like in about yeah. two years, but they don't. Right. So right. helping them understand some of the steps along the way and the milestones that they're going to hit, just like right. watching a baby grow. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, this, this senior is going to go through some phases and these are the kinds of things so mm -hmm. that when they see it, it's not so shocking. Mm -hmm. and, and it is, it's really in your face and it's really hard to watch your parent go through that. But when somebody professional has lined that out for you, it's not quite as scary. I mean, it, they, mm -hmm. they see that it's just that it's just the progression. Well, it's definitely a, a road, definitely right. a road map, as yes. you say. Yeah. So, yeah. Patty and Amy, thank you very much. It is time for a short break, and when we return, we'll begin to talk about how to identify an elder's needs and begin to look at how a care plan is developed. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Vital Living Forum on developing a care plan for an elder whose health is declining. I'm Katie Dagenet, and with me are Patty Antony and Amy O'Rourke, both professional care managers. Thank you for being here with us today and staying with us. Let's go ahead and start, Patty. Um, can you tell us what is the first step in developing this care plan that we've been talking about? The first step, I think, is meeting. I, I generally like to meet with the children first without okay. the parent because they can tell me things that they may be afraid to say in front of a parent. And also parents get really overwhelmed with the length of time that it takes to have those discussions. Um, we'll start with just talking about the situation, um, what kind of help they're looking for. Mm -hmm. It's kind of funny because usually I'd say 50% of the time what they're looking for or think they're looking for is not what they end up with. Yeah. Okay. But, yeah. but they'll tell me the story of what they're seeing, where, where their concerns are, maybe some health history mm -hmm. on mom. Uh, I like to get a complete list of medications and kind of get through what other issues because sometimes there's maybe diabetes in there or some mm -hmm. other things that are going to play in later for what kind of caregiver we have to utilize. Mm -hmm. um, we start with that. I look at the support system of the family, how much involvement they can have. Some of them are out of town and there's not going to be much. Um, sometimes parents are um, living alone. Um, or they're widowed and they're really alone. Mm -hmm. um, so we look at the support system. Um, I look at the um, finances pretty pretty heavily because that is going to help to drive where where and what we can do. Right. So we go through a pretty detailed explanation of where where the finances are and how things are set up. Um, I like to know who they're 
their practitioners are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's really it's really an assessment of many different areas, and you've touched on a couple of them. Um, let's let's kind of go through some others as well. You mentioned medication history. Why is that so important, Amy? Well. There's three main reasons an elder goes to a hospital unnecessarily, and one of them is medication. Okay. So let's just put that right out on the table. Um, there are medications, the amounts and the types, sometimes with an elder, particularly with a memory impairment, um, create problems with mm -hmm. behaviors that are oftentimes not addressed. Okay. So that becomes really important to look at to see if that's happening. And we sometimes secure help from uh, the physicians or geriatric psychopharmacologists to mm -hmm. look at that uh, and make some recommendations. And sometimes it's just a little tweak of the medicine can help change the stability in the home. And it's amazing how many seniors hoard medications mm -hmm. because they're expensive yeah. and even though they aren't taking them anymore or they were allergic to them they spent all that money on them so they don't want to have um, throw them out or, yeah. or, or yeah. get rid of them so I, I found apothecary bottles that were glass <laughs> <laughs> that were probably 30 years old the bottles were worth way more than the pills yeah. Right. Yeah. so yeah. That, that that's a big issue actually mm -hmm. medication is huge and then sometimes people have memory loss so they can't remember to mm -hmm. take their medications and they might need reminders mm -hmm. or systems in place to help them remember and sometimes it's funny with an elder who's resistant to care mm -hmm. if you can take medication that's something that's concrete and understandable okay. and if you help them with that area it builds a level of trust mm -hmm. that you can then move over to another area that they might not have felt more comfortable right so it can be an easy bridge to other issues that they might not be so open to getting help mm -hmm. over and one of those issues is just functioning in daily life yeah. I would imagine right. correct yeah. that's right. another issue it is, it right. is. I call it energy depletion so every decade that goes by, you lose a certain amount of energy. Mm -hmm. So when you hit 80, you hit 85, you have limited, even more limited stores of energy. So if you have to go to five different doctors, that's your life. Mm -hmm. And then the kids are saying, hey, I want you to go to the Y three times a week. I want right. you to, and they're saying, I might, you know, I, all my energy is on going to the doctor. Right. It's a part-time right. job. So mm -hmm. we help look at the elder's life mm -hmm. and look at what they're expending in terms of energy, where it can be pulled down and put towards things that they deem important. Mm -hmm. And um, as a physical therapist, I'm really big on that energy conservation yeah. thing because sometimes bathrooms need to be modified in mm -hmm. order to get in and out of a shower much easier. If you have right. a tub shower situation, right. Right. stepping over the tub might mean the difference of a, ba of a person bathing or not. Yeah. They, they really start to avoid that tub mm -hmm. and they start sponge bathing and some other other things. You know, yeah. So looking at how can we make this an easier thing so that they're not burning up all their energy just right. to get through a shower. Mm -hmm. One of the other things that you look at, um, the level of assistance that mm -hmm. they, they need and that they currently have, correct? Mm -hmm. Correct. Correct. If, if um, a person's having a lot of trouble getting in and out of bed, mm -hmm. it might be that we need a caregiver just for that couple of hours okay. in the morning to help them get started. Mm -hmm. and once they get started and on their feet, they're okay. Mm -hmm. um, and call sometimes, the, we call it the drive-by. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. The drive -by. And, and we do the drive-by sometimes twice a day. You do a split shift where sure. you have somebody uh, coming in, in morning, for the, <laughs> going, get, reversing get the start, it in the afternoon. Let them have their right. day, and then at the end of the day, wrapping them up mm -hmm. and getting their dinner, and then they can go to bed and be fine for the night. Right. right. And, and getting their medication too I want, mm -hmm. as, as well so right. there may be needs for that at the beginning at the end of the day yeah. right and sometimes too there's there's some really cute um, amazing technology out there mm -hmm. so so using a, a computerized medication box that automatically dispenses mm -hmm. um, they have one that that actually has a voice that says it's time to take your medicine it used to beep but everybody went to the microwave so now, that, <laughs> so now they have this computer box that says come take your medicine they push a button the pills dispense mm -hmm. um, there's some and that that's one of the main reasons I think that people go to assisted living is that parents are starting to take their medications improperly or right. skipping them mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. picking and choosing which pills they're going to take today and they're not taking them properly and the next thing you know they're sick. Right. Um, right. So that, that mm -hmm. you know, some simple things like that, even just a pill box that maybe um, an aide can help remember to help them remember to take mm -hmm. and not, mm -hmm. but it's maybe set up by a nurse or by a family member. Um, those kinds of things can make just all the difference in the world for, for a patient's independence. Right, meal prep. 
Mm -hmm. Just right. here, here's your meal, it's out on the table, so they don't have to do anything but sit down and eat it. And they don't have to spend that energy right. trying to just prepare the meal. Right, exactly. right. Standing, at the, standing at the stove can be, mm -hmm. they're, they're, by the time the mm -hmm. food is ready, they're exhausted. Mm -hmm. They don't even feel like eating now. Mm -hmm. But also there's depression that comes into this too, and when somebody's yeah. living alone, I know when I'm alone, I'm not really in the mood to cook. If there's nobody right. to cook mm -hmm. for right. and there's nobody to eat with, you tend to graze. Mm -hmm. And so that then you start to run into a lot of nutrition issues that go with it or sickness uh -huh. because they're taking their meds on an empty stomach. Or and you add the emory, memory impairment oh, yeah, and they absolutely. eat and eat and eat because they forgot that they just ate or they don't eat thinking that they ate. Right, yeah. right. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there are a lot of components mm -hmm. to the assessment. How long does it usually take to do the assessment? I would say it depends. I feel like mm -hmm. a politician. Yeah. <laughs> it depends. Uh, mine usually takes, I can't usually get them done in under two and a half hours. Okay. Usually between two and two and a half hours. And that's why I start with the family first mm -hmm. and not the, the senior. Right, right. It, it really depends on what they can tolerate and how you yeah. stage it out. But I would say an average time would be a couple of hours. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And as you're, as you're working on the assessment, you're looking at goals. Let's talk a little bit about the goals because there, everyone has maybe has different goals. They may not match up. Uh, right. It's, it's, that's the key <laughs> to the whole issue. Right. So the, the most important thing is getting all the goals out on the table. Mm -hmm. right. What are the kids' goals? What are the elders' goals? And then picking one, I think, mm -hmm. that everybody can agree, yeah, if we can do this one thing, mm -hmm. which might be three meals a day might be okay. two meals a day. Something mm -hmm. simple. Something simple, mm -hmm. we're gonna start there. And then we help the kids get help with their expectations, going mm -hmm. back to what we had said earlier, and getting the elder to bond over something else that's important to them. Okay. Right. Um, what's, what's, and I'm sure Patty asked this question too, what to the elder is your most pressing worry? Mm -hmm. What do you think about throughout the day that bothers you? Mm -hmm. And we try to have that be a goal mm -hmm. to fix. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and falls is a big one. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. people are, yeah. are paralyzed by the fear of falling. Right. And to the extent that they almost make it a self-fulfilling prophecy oh, sometimes. Oh, right. They'll so, sleep in their chair. Absolutely. So they don't, night, so they don't have to stand up and go to right. the... Yeah. Right. Okay. Right. And going to the bathroom is a huge issue. And mm -hmm. then you'll see people start skipping their, their diuretic because they don't want, want to, to go have to, the to go to the bathroom at night. Yeah. Um, some of the medications that they take might make them really groggy and their blood pressure might drop when mm -hmm. they first get up. Mm -hmm. And so teaching them how to do positional changes and so forth so that they are a little safer. Mm -hmm. I try to make people see me as a, a as a resource person, mm -hmm. though, not as a... As a, a I'm not going to direct your life. Right. I'm just right. going to help you figure out some options for the solutions. Mm -hmm. And that helps and the senior doesn't feel like there's somebody coming and taking over. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, and then another this. factor in the care plan thing would be then what are we going to look for in the future that would indicate we're going to adjust this care plan. Sure. Right. And making sure that they have a little glimpse of what the future might hold. Right. right. And, and, when, and when you would do that. And when right. you would do that. Right. And so how do you actually get to the development part of this and, and what is involved in developing this care plan? Well, Patty and I may or may not have different styles. I don't know. I don't like to use the language of a care plan with an elder. Okay. I keep that language right. with the kids. Because mm -hmm. right. if you use care plan with an elder, they feel like the patient and that's just like they're being taken right. care of. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. So we develop the care plan with the kids um, and work up the goals, and we just say to the to the elder, what things are important to you, and this mm -hmm. is what we're going to be a team to to approach. And we, mm -hmm. we leave all that academic healthcare language out of the way. And then with the kids, we say, you know, through an email or through you know a phone conference, mm -hmm. these are the projects that we're working on. This is the goal. This is what we're going to know when we're going to know we've attained it. And mm -hmm. then time frame. And usually the first 90 days it looks differently than when it's gonna look after the 90 days, because okay. things kind of take a few months to stabilize. Mm -hmm. And then what are we gonna know is success mm -hmm. and define that, and then making sure that we have a set time to follow up on those goals. Okay. And people need to realize that it does take time. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't rush it. And much as mm -hmm. a, lot of, a lot of type A people would like to have that mm -hmm. list get them nailed down, it just doesn't work that way. You have to kind of go at it in little pieces 
-hmm. and help the person get there. Yeah. You know? And then, of course, you end up with five siblings mm -hmm. that don't agree. Right. You know? right. And so yeah. you're, you're, you're always, and it seems like the one that lives the furthest away is the one that has the strongest opinion. They have opinion. the strongest opinion. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. But, my, but <laughs> trying to just help people, you know, kind of come to, uh, I spend a lot of time, I would call it mediation. Yeah. Really mm -hmm. helping yeah. people realize where mom is and how, how this is going to go down and, and help them come to some very simple goals that can be attainable quickly mm -hmm. so they feel like they're making a little progress mm -hmm. and um, and then at, at what point are we going to have to make this other bigger change and so right. forth and defining when mm -hmm. that is so that it, it's not it's not an object it's not a subjective people like for example driving this mm -hmm. is a big issue and and the people think oh well she's 85 she should not be driving well I know a lot of 85 year olds that are a lot more safe than a 16 year old right okay mm -hmm. so I don't think age has anything to do I think it's it depends on their reflexes yeah. and their their mm -hmm. agility and their ability their to you know and how mm -hmm. far are they going if they're just going around the block that's different than getting on I-4 and heading off you know mm -hmm. down south to mm -hmm. visit somebody down south so I mean so looking at some of those things and trying to objectify when we make that change so that it's there's a, there's actually a, a, a road map for that mm -hmm. right and they're not just pulling it out of a hat there there there's actually a process to determine when a person should stop driving and that sort right. of thing mm -hmm. it helps a lot to define those goals and, and I know that when we talk about medicine and maybe driving those are some of the more common things that get incorporated mm -hmm. into mm -hmm. a care plan or this road map what are some of the uncommon that especially as you're working with kids they, they look at you kind of like you have two heads because they don't think that that should be incorporated. Are there uncommon components? Yeah, yeah. yeah. When you're dealing with people, it gets so interesting. It just gets <laughs> so interesting. Yeah. I had a, uh, a woman who had a routine. Her routine was going to the church, mm -hmm. feeding the oh-so-fat squirrels, <laughs> making the church oh-so-very mad, <laughs> going to the dollar store, spending money at the dollar store. She had a routine that she went through, mm -hmm. and that was my primary goal was to maintain that for her. Okay. Now, she had one tooth, just one, mm -hmm. and the daughter's goal was a set of dentures. Okay. Yeah. And they didn't match the goal. They don't. They, right. Yeah. Right. right. So that was a little different. We yeah. had to bring those two things together. Um, and I know you have, I had a woman who really was confined to a wheelchair that wanted to go to the pool three times a week. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Those are, those are heartfelt. Right. I had one woman that loved pets and she couldn't have pets in her condo. So we had her go into the pet store every day mm -hmm. to play with, with the, the puppies. And yeah. The, yeah. 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 So right. that's when you start getting into the humanness of a care mm -hmm. plan. Right. That's when it gets really interesting. And you, and you get creative. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's kind of fun. I had a, yeah. a gentleman who was driving a red Jaguar and he was a hundred years old and and we knew that it was time to not drive a Jaguar anymore so wow. we got him a golf cart that looked like one okay yeah and he loved it because mm -hmm. he got more attention off of sure. that than he did his car but we got the car safely away from yeah. him without yeah. ruining his right. dignity yeah. and everything else he still had that that to go with so it can be fun to really create and just sort of look at what what is it what, what is the issue mm -hmm. and is there a way we can do this that yeah. keeps the dignity of the person that's what I love about being a care manager mm -hmm. so that's that's the draw for me mm -hmm. now before we go to break um, let's touch on what are the costs that are associated with building this framework because I, I know many people who are watching are probably thinking well this, this all sounds very helpful but what are the costs for, for our fees, is that mm -hmm. what the question is? I think the average, um, I can't, I mean, I can only speak to mine, but the average comprehensive assessment, if they're coming into my office, mm -hmm. is probably around 375. Mm -hmm. If I'm okay. going out as a part of that, and mm -hmm. you know, like they come to me first, and then I go out and mm -hmm. assess the home, it might be closer to 500. Mm -hmm. Is that about what? It is, and what we say to people is, you're gonna pay, um, you know, three to $700 to get information to run it yourself mm -hmm. and to probably save you with what we know so that 700 right, yeah. or 500 yes. or 300 is going to come back to you sure sure then you can go from there and spend you know eight hundred thousand dollars a month to have your mom managed right you could have it right. managed for as little as a couple hundred a month you could have it so so those ranges are all mm -hmm. then care dependent sure but for as little as three to seven hundred you can get information that will 
help you run it yourself. Sure, sure. And it saves a lot of money. Yeah, and and what we, you know, we've been doing this for a long time, Amy and I, and it's, yeah. um, what I can accomplish in an hour might take somebody who's never done it before mm -hmm. three weeks of playing around three with it. Three weeks of they playing off and just... time off work. So sure. they've lost yeah. money because right. they can't work. So you Trying also, to, we yeah. teach them how to look at the cost of that assessment. Very good. Well, I think this is a really good place to take a break. And when we come back, we will take a look at moving from the document itself into coordinating the care, as well as monitoring and evaluating the needs of the client. So stay with us. Welcome back to the Vital Living Forum on developing a care plan. In our third and final segment, we will look at how a care plan can be effectively implemented. Stay with us to learn how to best coordinate care, monitoring services, and evaluate the changing needs of an elder. I'm Katie Dagenet, and with me are Patty Antony and Amy O'Rourke, who have more than 50 years of combined experience in serving the needs of Central Florida's elders. So, Patty, one of the first things that we want to talk about in this segment is how do we, do we implement in finding the appropriate caregiver because it's a big decision. It's a huge decision. First thing I have to do is kind of get a handle on the personality of the person I'm going to be working with to find a caregiver for. Um, what kinds of things are they comfortable with? Um, what kind of prejudice they may have? Mm -hmm. um, um, I look to see what what level of care they're going to need mm -hmm. and then help them come to what whether it should be an agency, whether it should be uh, maybe just even family support that we're going to try to implement mm -hmm. if that's where the caregiver um, comfort zone is. Mm -hmm. So I have to know what the person's abilities are and where they're at mentally right. to be able to help them find the right person. So there's actually a family interview, as I, understand, I, would, I would imagine, yes. um, to be able to get all this information. So what can can family members who are watching, what can they expect to be asked in that interview? Or what can the elder expect to be asked in that interview? What I like to see is I like to see a caregiver talking about their real experience. Mm -hmm. I, I, I love to listen to them. Tell me about your last client. Tell me about the, mm -hmm. your favorite. Tell me about the difficulties you've run into and let them talk to demonstrate their uh, style. Mm -hmm. And the real forceful style can really, really work and then with someone like a military general, not mm -hmm. so much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Right. Mm -hmm. So I like to listen to them, and then I like to see how long they've been certified, if mm -hmm. they're a certified nursing assistant, okay. if they're a home health aide, mm -hmm. what kind of background they've had, how many years of experience they've done it, and then that indefinable love. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. there is a group of caregivers that love older people, mm -hmm. and once you find that person that has that feeling you know you're in, right. it might not be that person that you're going to be having them work with, but you're going to find some place for sure. them. Right. Sure. And, and sometimes um, it's also finding that the best caregivers sometimes have life experience. They may have had yeah. a parent that they mm -hmm. took care of or a grandparent, and um, sometimes that life experience is, is huge, even if they don't have a lot of years of right. experience it's where, where they've been mm -hmm. in a life experience with it. Now, I know we touched on this in the first segment, but obviously, you know, this caregiver is going to, it could be coming into the home, most likely, mm -hmm. right. um, and, and you want to make sure that it's safe. And I imagine family members, kids of elders are concerned about mm -hmm. safety. So are caregivers, should they be licensed and bonded, um, insured? What should people be expecting from those they're talking to? Well, probably, I mean, I would, number one, make sure the background check has been completed. Mm -hmm. Two, you're going to want to check with your homeowner's insurance to make sure that whatever you're doing in the home is insured. Mm -hmm. You're going to want to talk to the agency if you use an agency to see what type of employees they are or if they're independent contractors, just to make sure that you're protected. Sure. And then what I wish I'd said earlier is one line from a caregiver that would really cause me pause would be to hear a caregiver say, I loved her as if she were my mother. That, to me, is a red flag that we might have some boundary issues mm -hmm. because you want to care, but you don't want to be so invasive or boundaryless right. that you then have skewed judgment. Uh -huh. right. That's right. right. And then, of course, finances are going to play a, a role here, too. Mm -hmm. We have to, whether or not they can afford and how many hours and what can we accomplish in a short mm -hmm. period of time if we are very limited on that, mm -hmm. where are the priorities, how efficient is that person, 
Um, I like to know that they're in good health and they yeah. don't have a lot of issues mm -hmm. with their own health that could jeopardize the senior. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if they're smokers or whatever, all of that kind of stuff has to kind sure. of be looked at. So, and also, can they drive? Yeah. And driving is a big thing. Mm -hmm. And so, if they're if they are going to drive, are they going to drive the senior's car? Are they going to drive their own car? Mm -hmm. Is their mm -hmm. own car insured? Is their own car in good shape? Right. Mm -hmm. How big is it? I've had a couple of people oh. pull up in trucks <laughs> <laughs> and trying to figure out how we're going to get that four foot ten <laughs> granny up into the right, truck right. cab. Oh, right. So, I mean, all of those kind of things kind of have yeah. to be looked at. So, I help mm -hmm. the families develop a little checklist mm -hmm. of the kind of things they should be asking so they're not just looking at the person oh she seems real sweet mm -hmm. or he seems real but but you know let's get down to the hardcore number one we don't want them bringing their kids with them mm -hmm. or and, and maybe that is okay but maybe we you know just the boundaries like sure. you said the boundaries mm -hmm. and um, making sure we've had all kinds of funny situations people brought their pets I was like, oh you know, I had one right. caregiver bring her squirrel <laughs> <laughs> well, for the lady who fed him at the church, I probably worked out well. <laughs> So, so let me ask you this, um, it, it, when we bring in caregivers uh, into uh, an elder's home, mm -hmm. it, it, it might be uh, temporary, but more than likely it is going to be something that's going to be on an ongoing basis. Mm -hmm. That has to present its own set of challenges, that this is something that's just continual mm -hmm. and it's not for a short period of time. Mm -hmm. and, and then sometimes those boundaries can be crossed. For example, I was when I was home just a couple weeks ago with my mom, she was handing her debit card to her the aide saying, get me some cash while you're out, and gave mm -hmm. her the PIN number. Yeah. I about had a heart attack. Yeah. But those kinds of things happen when, when there's, you know, somebody's been with you a long, long time. There's trust issues that mm -hmm. maybe are going above and beyond. And there are some things that you can do to kind of set the stage for that. So my brother and I have a checking account that has a finite amount of money that mom has that debit card on. Mm -hmm. So that if anything did happen, at least we aren't losing sure. every, you know, the whole financial picture. Mm -hmm. um, and it is difficult. You have to look at those issues. How is the aide going to pay for the groceries mm -hmm. if she takes mom grocery shopping? Um, and mom's not able to write checks anymore. Mm -hmm. um, those kinds of things have to be looked at. Petty cash. Mm -hmm. um, if they're going to go out to lunch, who's paying? Sure. And is, is the aide getting the lunch included into that or not? Mm -hmm. Those are all those kinds of questions that a family needs to look at. And those are the logistics, I mm -hmm. think, of the, of the hiring process where we can be really helpful because we've, we've seen it all mm -hmm. for, for mm -hmm. the most part. Now let's fast forward in the care plan. You know, we've been comparing this to a business plan, mm -hmm. and obviously they monitor business plans based on effectiveness. Is it mm -hmm. working? How do you monitor a care plan to see if it's working properly? What are some of the, the benchmarks or some of the things that you look at to make sure that you're getting what you're paying for? From a child's perspective, I think if mom or dad are safe, if they have more days where it's peaceful and mm -hmm. stable, mm -hmm. if they haven't lost a lot of weight or gained a lot of weight, mm -hmm. if they um, are kind of getting used to the caregiver. And, and we see more often than not, a new rhythm begins with the caregiver and the elder where they get kind of into a rhythm mm -hmm. that feels heartwarming. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so you look at those non-tangibles also Right. To, mm -hmm. to determine whether it's working or not. And then and then what hasn't happened? We haven't had sure. any acute crises happen sure. in six months. My gosh, this is the longest I've ever gone without right. there being a crisis. Right. Or mom's not calling me every 15 minutes now. She's mm -hmm. got someone else to yeah, talk to. Yeah, yeah. maybe the measurement like, was hasn't happened. Yeah, yeah right. that's right. right. The, the negatives. Yeah, yeah. The um, other thing I think with... Um, implementing I find that th at the beginning I might have to be really involved I might it might even yeah. be daily for mm -hmm. me having some sort of you know tweaking it and then it, it sort of falls into where I can maybe even monitor once a month mm -hmm. and just do a mm -hmm. visit and see how things are going mm -hmm. um, phone calls in between to check on things but it's not as time intensive so mm -hmm. at the beginning it might be a little expensive getting that started up right. and getting all those little pieces in place and the logistics worked out mm -hmm. and then it can fall into its own rhythm where I'm just checking in mm -hmm. and available in case something happens or somebody gets sick or whatever and mm -hmm. we can we can step in at that point mm -hmm. so it, it 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 falls into its own rhythm mm -hmm. and I think 
I think I don't know. What do you What do you find? I find once a month for on an average, mm -hmm. but then it just depends. There's a couple folks that I have that really need almost it, weekly. It monitoring. really depends. It depends on the children. Where do they live? Right. Do they work right. full time? And what the budget is and right. what the expectations. Sometimes mm -hmm. the kids will say, "I don't want to have anything to do with it. It's too much stress for me. Mm -hmm. My mm -hmm. mom is never going to listen to me, and I want you to be the bad guy." Mm -hmm. okay. And that's fine. Yeah. So it really it depends right. on a lot of factors right. and. Um, Right, right. And you, we've talked about how uh, you, you're working very closely with the children of elders, and in some cases, in many cases, they may not be living nearby. Mm -hmm. um, so there seems to be this emerging market of, of home sensors and monitoring devices that I guess yeah. can be used in conjunction mm -hmm. um, with the caregiver and as part of that care plan. Mm -hmm. um, what would you say about those? Because there's so many out there. There are. There are. There are. I've, I've been really pleased with some of the the newer life alert type of things, the falling I can't mm -hmm. get up kind of mm -hmm. devices that have auto alerts. Okay. Because in all the years of physical therapy, I think I've only had two patients who remembered to push the button <laughs> when they fell. <laughs> know, they they think of everything else, but they so can't they, think yeah, of pushing the button or, so the, or the thing is hanging on mm -hmm. the wall right. over, you know. Right. But the auto alert has saved my mom. She's had two strokes. Mm -hmm. And by the time she had her eyes open, the fire department was standing over her both times because it had an accelerometer in the little device and when mm -hmm. she went down it recorded the fall okay and she, and activated everything mm -hmm. one time she was outside and she had fallen under the bushes and oh. and so all, the only thing sticking she said I felt like I was in Kansas cuz <laughs> <laughs> my feet were sticking out from under the bush and, and nobody could see me you know and so oh. um, but that little auto alert thing really yeah. did work and okay. um, Devices are great, but it doesn't substitute for caregiving. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's there's yeah. there's just the interaction, the human interaction that is really important. It's I true. Think. Technology alone, without that personal touch right. with an elder, it will never work. Right. right. Right, but it can be very helpful. It can be helpful. It can be really helpful, and um, it can like we have some alarm systems that are on beds, so that if a patient's trying to get up without mm -hmm, somebody helping mm -hmm, them, mm -hmm. they just get a warning system. But mm -hmm. you still need the caregiver there. So, mm -hmm. and and we have people that will hire would try to get me to come to do a whole bunch of renovations in the house, and yeah. I don't care how many grab bars you put in. If a person doesn't know how to use them or doesn't have the mental capacity right, right. to know what to do those modifications are just expensive mm -hmm. changes to a house that aren't going to work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so. the cameras are really controversial. Oh, okay. yeah. I have kids that love the cameras. They love to know everything that's going on. It's kind of like Big Brother oh, for yeah. the creepy. elder. It can yes. be kind of yeah. creepy. Yeah. So yes. it's one of those things that it's out there and there's a lot of big marketing efforts to try mm -hmm. to push that in there. but. Um, it's a little scary to think about. Right. Some of the invisible fence type of things that they have for people mm -hmm. where they have like a wander guard yeah. that will allow a person to have pretty free move, movement but if they get beyond a certain perimeter mm -hmm. it'll go off. It doesn't It doesn't obviously shock the patient but it, <laughs> it does set off a GPS type mm -hmm. of thing in the house so that the caregiver can see where they are. Mm -hmm. And that, those are really handy for mm -hmm. being able to allow a person that maybe likes to work out in the yard but you're afraid they're going to wander or away or right. fall in the grass, mm -hmm. you at least get some kind of um, mobility with folks that gives them abilities to do things that they used to not, you know, you just were afraid to let them out the door because mm -hmm. yeah. they, they might wander away. Mm -hmm. And um, they have they have them so that you can wear a device in the mall and mm -hmm. if you get too far apart it sets off a little beep so that mm -hmm. people know that their their loved ones starting to walk off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, but it still makes them have some, you know, feeling of independence and dignity yeah. of being mm -hmm. able to do some yeah. stuff. So so those things are very helpful but they're just adjunct tools. Right. They right. don't substitute for real caregiving. Yeah. So well, Patty and Amy, this has been a fascinating conversation. How can people reach you? Patty, let's start with you because you've shared so much sure. information. I have an, a website which is www.elder, e l d e r a d v as in Victor, dot com. Um, I have a phone which is 407 898 9080. And you can get to me on an email through the website. Okay. And um, right. I'm absolutely happy to talk to anybody that has questions. Very good. Amy? I have a website. It's called the Cameron Group dot US and our phone number is 407-896-2010. Patty and Amy, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.
And I'd like to thank Patty Anthony and Amy O'Rourke for walking us through the process of developing a care plan. It's a comprehensive tool and a critical tool for helping families understand the caregiving journey. It is also an effective tool to help an elder best coordinate their long-term care needs, improve their quality of life, and maintain their independence for as long as possible. The Vital Living Forum is part of Orange County's Vital Living Block on Vision TV. And for more information, please visit, vised us on the web at www.orangetvfl.net or contact the Orange County Office on Aging at 407-836-6563. I'm Katie Dagenet. Thank you for joining us.